all across the world, women are seen as unequal to men, are rarely educated, and are often the targets of rape and abduction in unstable areas. They walk miles every day for food and water to provide for their families. Women often work in low-paying, undignified jobs just to make a small amount of money. They are denied the right to own land, have less access to medical care, and are far less likely to be politically active. Issues that are related to women are also linked to issues that are related to children. That links to issues that are related to the family and the community. So gender encompasses looking at all groups that are marginalized or who don't have power. I think there are still mindsets that exist all over the world in many different cultures that uh, still see women as being uh, fundamentally unequal some, in some cultures and in some uh, religious systems fundamentally flawed. Women face various problems on a daily basis. One woman in particular, Zenibet Gashaw, represents the struggle of many women in developing countries. Zenibet Gashaw, like many other women in Ethiopia, gets up at 4.30 a.m., prepares coffee and breakfast for her husband and children, walks her children to school, which can take up to an hour and a half, and returns home for a long day of cooking, cleaning, and fetching water. At dinner, Zenibet feeds her husband first, children second, and herself last, which is the norm in many African countries. This leaves Zenibek with little or no food, so she barely has the energy and nutrition to stay healthy and work in the formal economy. All of the problems women face are related, but education is the key to helping women overcome barriers and raise the standard of life for their families and countries. Education is a huge tool of empowerment. If you have knowledge, it helps you see things in a different light and, and really have a better idea of the things that you can achieve. In one of CRS's democracy programs, we encourage women to participate in their local government and to run for local office. And a woman named Hoda, who was in her early 30s, decided to do this. She's really a remarkable woman. She's a widow, a young widow. She has three young boys. She never finished school. And yet she decided in her late 20s, when her youngest son was about seven, to go back to school to finish her education. And she actually brought her little boy to class once because she wanted to make sure she could take an exam. She was actually criticized by her teacher for doing this, but she was determined to get an education and to take this exam. So she's, she's very much in favor of literacy. She really wants the people in her village, especially the girls, to learn to read and write. And she's one of the women who ran for office in Egypt. And last April, in April 2008, she won. She won her village council election. And now she's working on different things she wants to do in her village. She wants to tackle literacy in her community. She wants to deal with medical care and roads for the people in, in her community. So she's just one example of a really strong woman who has really beaten the odds and is very inspiring. Besides education, women can achieve empowerment through economic development. One way women can become economically stable is through microfinance. Microfinance programs give loans to the world's poor, especially women, so that they can support themselves and their families, develop skills and self-respect, and even transform entire communities. These affordable, essential financial services are restoring hope and dignity to more than one million people in 30 countries. The profits they would get from their business would help them buy more food for their family, pay school fees. So the microfinance programs that CRS runs really help women get on a solid economic footing so they're not at risk of sliding into extreme poverty. Savings and internal lending communities, also known as SILK, are a model of microfinance in which people regularly collect and save money within their communities. When needed, members of a SILK group are able to borrow a certain amount of money from the savings. Silk groups typically consist of 10 to 20 members, and at least three of the managing team members must be women. What women say they like most about the Silk groups is the social cohesion and solidarity among each other. You start to recognize similar patterns and similar problems just by talking about it. It is already empowering because you now have a voice and are more open to talk. And the more people that talk will influence the whole community as well. One woman in western Uganda who belonged to a silk group decided to open a small restaurant made of a few poles, straw, and a roof, located on a major road that only served Matuke. Once this business became very successful, she took out another loan to start a hotel business with one bed. After three years, she now has three restaurant huts and eight beds in her hotel. 
she can send all six of her children to school instead of just two, and they are able to eat three meals a day. Another part of empowerment is when women who have improved their lives motivate others to do the same. I interviewed several girls who, when I asked them what they wanted for their future, they said I would rather have nothing than to come back to my community and have these people see how successful I am and be a role model and come back and teach other girls to be like me. And that is really a strong, strong um, symbol for them, symbol for hope, I think, um, for all the girls in those villages to see girls going off, becoming successful, and then coming back, more importantly, coming back to their community where they could just as easily go anywhere once they have their education, but to come back and help those who they need the most. And that's why I think women need to be empowered and should be. Inspired by women in her community who joined a silk group, Marguerite, a woman from Burundi, joined silk and drastically improved her life. Marguerite used to pick through garbage for pieces of tin and plastic to sell to others in order to provide just one meal a day to her children. But now Marguerite has a business in the market with the other women in her silk group. She has improved her children's lives and is now thinking forward. I think um, stories like Marguerite's, uh, while they might be heartbreaking, they're also hope-filled and they really challenge us to think about, you know, how can we, as women who have more advantage, how can we help our sisters globally? In the United States, we have the power to help women around the world by making others aware of the issues women face and by advocating for social justice. For me, the most important tool is knowledge. I feel like if you share information about what's going on and let people know what the realities are, not only in terms of statistics and, and that sort of data, but also in terms of personal stories and what people are facing, that is a huge, huge tool for advocacy. It's not just important to recognize that gender is important, it's also important to do something about it. Meeting with your senators or writing them letters to inform them about issues that require attention are important in bringing about justice and development for women. It's up to us to hold our politicians accountable for seeking out human needs before seeking out profit. While there are still many challenges to overcome, some progress has been made. In March 2009, the U.S. State Department declared a new position of Special Ambassador on Global Women's Issues in order to consolidate all work dealing with women and to raise greater awareness that international women's rights are a critical component to the U.S. foreign policy. Anybody who wants to change the world has to not only look at their personal situation but look at the situation of those around them and what they can do to improve. Everyone has something that they can contribute, so it's being able to identify what is that thing that you can do to contribute. When you empower women, especially women who are um, heading up a household, who are single moms, who have kids, when you give them a way to make money, when you give them a voice in their community, you really make life better for the whole community. The kids are going to be healthier, they're going to get an education too. You're not going to see the extreme poverty that happens when women just have nowhere to turn and, and no money to raise their kids with. So empowering women is really key to stamping out poverty in so many developing countries.